I must be in Houston this late at the masjid. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al deen. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, wa min alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat, wa tawasaw bil haq, wa tawasaw bil sabr, ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Thumma amma ba'd, inshallah, I'll divide my talk into two parts. And the moment I start seeing some of you dozing off, I'll cut it short, inshallah. Um, being in the teaching business, one of the things you learn is there's no point teaching if you don't have a student in front of you. And how do you know if a student's in front of you? If their eyes are still open. So basically that's the formula I try to follow. Anyhow, the talk that I'm going to share with you now is divided into two parts. The first part of it is why study Arabic? The first part is why study Arabic? And the second part is how to study Arabic. So we're going to try to engage both these parts. I'll probably spend more time on the why and a little bit less time on the how and then take your questions inshallah ta'ala. So before we address the importance of Arabic study, I'm going to play a little bit of the opposite side's advocate. People say nowadays, well, not every Muslim has to learn Arabic. That's for the ulama, that's for the scholars. I'm just an average Muslim, I make my salah and you know, I don't really need to learn this language. And if Allah wanted me to know this language, He would have made me an Arab. It's in the hikmah of Allah that He made some of us Turks and others Pakistani and others Bangladeshi and others you know, European or whatever else. Allah didn't create everybody an Arab. So why do I have to learn Arabic? It's not my fault that I don't know it. And the other argument you hear is Allah sent the Qur'an not just to the Arabs. Who did He send the Qur'an to? He sent Qur'an as a guidance for all of mankind. Right? All of mankind. So when we hear these arguments, then it's, you start thinking, yeah, that makes sense. It's okay to read an Urdu translation, or a Persian translation, or an English translation, or a French translation, etc., etc. Because at least these translators, which is the third argument really, they must know what they're doing. It's not like these people just get up one day and write a translation. These are people that know what they're doing. So how can you disregard their work and say, no, nothing compares with Qur'an in Arabic, you have to learn the Arabic language. So we're going to try and address this problem inshallah ta'ala. This by the way is a popular line of thinking among many Muslims nowadays. Many Muslims think like this. And I want to address this issue with a number of arguments. And we're going to stick with Qur'an in the beginning. For the average Muslim in the world, doesn't matter where they come from. If you ask them, why is Arabic important? Any Muslim. The one who is knowledgeable, the one who is not knowledgeable. The one who is religious, the one who is not that religious they will pretty much give you the same answer. Arabic is important because of Qur'an. That's the number one answer everybody will give you. And every Muslim man, woman and child pretty much in the world, if they've studied even a little bit of their religion, they know that when they're reading anything except the Arabic of the Qur'an, that doesn't count as Qur'an. The Qur'an says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The Qur'an does not say praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. That's not Qur'an. Anybody will tell you, what's Qur'an? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Not the translation. Okay? So this is already in the psyche of the Muslims. But we want to take this argument a little bit further. You see, Allah Azza wa Jal, and I'll keep the matter brief, Allah Azza wa Jal, whenever He sent messengers, in order to help them with their mission, Allah also sent with them a miracle. This is what the aqidah of the Muslim, the belief of the Muslims is. So the messengers came and tried to tell people something very difficult to accept. I was telling some of the brothers the same thing this morning. Imagine if you lived a few thousand years ago, and your neighbor came over to you, and he said, you know, last night an angel came to me and gave me revelation. And he told me that I'm a messenger of God. And whatever I have to say from now on, it's actually not me, it's from Allah, delivered to me by these angels. So yes, you know me as your neighbor all this, this, our whole life, but from now on, I am a messenger of Allah. And not only do you have to believe everything I'm telling you right now, from here, henceforward, everything I tell you to do, you must do. Because it's actually not just me telling you to do it, I'm telling you to do this on behalf of a higher authority. This is what your neighbor comes and tells you. Nowadays, we call these kinds of people crazy. If somebody did that to you nowadays, of course we know there's no more messengers coming. But imagine even a few thousand years ago, how easy is that to believe about your neighbor? About your uncle? About your cousin? Is that an easy thing to believe? It's not easy. 
most people will actually find it funny. Can I see this angel? You sure angel came to you? You sure, what did you have for dinner last night? Are you feeling okay? Right? They're gonna think this person's kidding. They can't be serious. Or maybe they're suffering from some kind of psychological disorder. Something happened to them. They were normal yesterday, now they're talking all crazy. Right? When we look at Quran, we find the messengers alayhim salam what did people say about them? Majnoon, Sahir, right? Mashoor, magic has been done on them, they're possessed by a jinn, they've, got, they've been driven to madness, they're insane, they're crazy, don't listen to them. And we think and we say, how can people say that about a messenger? What kind of cruel people must they be? But if you put yourself in those shoes, you can understand that what the messenger is asking you to believe is not something easy. First of all, he's asking you to believe something you can't even see. It's easy to believe in a God, by the way. If, you, if I go to somebody and say, you know, there is someone who created everything, and he's all-powerful, people, most people say, you know, I already believe in a God. Yeah, that's not hard to believe. But if somebody goes to someone and says, you know, that God chose a human being, and talked to that human being, and told him what, what he wants us to do, that part of it becomes difficult. Because by nature, human beings don't like to follow other human beings. Easy, it's easier to believe in Allah, it's harder to believe in the Rasul of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all of the Anbiya, same problem. So when Allah sent messengers, in order to help them, Allah gave them something that they could show people that would make them easier to believe. It would be an easier pill to swallow, so to speak. For example, with Salih Alaihi Salam, People are not accepting what he has to say. They're ridiculing him. Allah sends him a she camel, Naqatullah. Right? It comes out of a boulder. It drinks up an entire lake in one sip. This, is, can, this can only be from Allah, because we know how much a bladder of an animal can hold. Right? So when they see that, okay, you know what? Maybe he's, yeah, he's pretty much a messenger. If we were standing next to Musa alayhi salam when the water was splitting, if we were standing right next to him, if before you're kind of skeptical, and this guy's gonna get us killed. Some of the people, this is in the, actually the Old Testament. Some of them narrated this. They're in their own books. He's gonna get us killed, look at what he brought us to. Now we're either, we're, our two, two choices are either drown here, or be slaughtered by the armies of the Pharaoh. And at that point, when you saw the water parting, would you have any doubt that he's a messenger of Allah? Not at that point. At that point, your, your doubts would disappear. This can only be a messenger of Allah. Right? Because something that you see something that no human being can do. That can only be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know that Allah gave our messengers a very difficult mission, all of them. The message was very difficult to deliver, but to help them deliver the message, Allah also gave them a miracle. Allah Azza wa Jal also gave them a miracle. When we come to our final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah gave him the message, we call it Quran. Allah gave him a miracle, what do we call that? Quran, same thing. The Quran is the message and the Quran is the miracle. With Salih alayhi salam, he had the message and it separately he had a miracle. With Musa alayhi salam, he had a message and separately he had a miracle. With Isa alayhi salam, he had a message and then also he had a miracle. Two separate things. With Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, what did Allah do? One thing. Quran is the message and it is also the miracle, both at the same time. I was telling this to my sixth grade class one time. I used to teach at a school, I was teaching Islamic studies and I was explaining this to my students. And one of my students said, Brother Noman, it's not fair. I said, what's not fair? He said, well all these other messengers got such cool stuff. They got a, a cane turning into a snake, a dead guy comes back to life, a water, you know, a river completely parts, or ocean completely opens up, right? You got all kinds of cool stuff. And all we got is a book. Now it sounds blasphemous, but he's on to something. There is a difference between what Allah gave the other messengers and what Allah gave to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is a difference, there's a fundamental difference. And the fundamental difference can be summarized in this way. What Allah gave to the previous prophets and messengers alayhi wa sallam, was something for the eyes to see. But what Allah gave to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam predominantly is something for the ear to listen to. The Qur'an, yasma'una, Allah says, they listen. 
فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Listen to it carefully. سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We heard and we obeyed. إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا We heard a unique Qur'an. The Qur'an is first and foremost a listening experience. Allah Azza wa Jal describes our Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He recites onto them the ayat. He doesn't give it to them to read first. The book form is later on. What did the Messenger do first? He made people listen to himself. He delivered the Qur'an and this was an audio experience. Right? As opposed to all the other messengers and their miracles, they were video experience. You see the difference? Now the difference, another difference is, if I was fortunate enough to live in the life of a messenger, a previous messenger, let's say in the time of Isa a.s. And I saw him perform his miracles. And I teach my children, Isa was a messenger of Allah because he performed these miracles. I saw it with my own eyes. My child believes me, and when, he, when his child grows up, he teaches him the same thing. And then his child teaches his child. But further down, the great-grandfather who saw it with his own eyes has a different kind of belief. Because he saw it with his own eyes. But the great-great-great-grandchild, does he have the same kind of belief? There's a difference, right? He believes it because his parents told him. But it's not something he saw himself. It's not something he saw himself. Leave this point aside for a moment. We just said Qur'an is a message, and Qur'an is also a miracle. Allah Azza wa Jal put two things in the Qur'an. When somebody translates the Qur'an, even in the best translation, at the most they will try to capture some of the message. They will try to capture some of the message. But it is impossible to capture the miracle. It's impossible. The miracle of Qur'an is only in the words of Allah. His own choice of words. That's what makes them miraculous. So if I try to tell you what an ayah means in English, or in Urdu, or any other language, I may be able to give you something about the meaning of the ayah. But I cannot, I cannot display to you the beauty and the miracle of the ayah. That's impossible. That really is impossible. And I wanted to demonstrate to you, there's no board here, so this is an oral exercise actually. Let's do the oral exercise like we did this morning. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in Surah Al-Muddathir, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرُ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرُ The wow in the beginning is like the English capital letter. Like when you start a new sentence, you begin with capital letter. In, in Arabic, wow can be used for many things, over 21 things. One of them is an istinaf, to start a new sentence. So you could think of the wow in the beginning as a new sentence. The rest of the ayah says, رَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرُ Now listen to this carefully. What's the first letter you hear when I say Rabbaka? What's the first letter of the Arabic alphabet that you hear? Everybody heard the Ra? Rabbaka? Now listen for the last letter. Rabbaka fakabbir. What's the last letter you heard? Okay. Now listen carefully for the second letter. Rabbaka. What's the second letter? Rabbaka. Ba. Listen for the second last letter. Rabbaka fakabbir. What's the second last letter? Ba. Rabbaka. What's the third letter? Kaf. Rabbaka. Fakabbir. What's the third last letter? You notice something? It's spelled backwards and forwards the same way. It's spelled backwards and forwards the same way. In English literature, we call this a palindrome. Something that spells backwards and forwards the same way. Like Bob or race car. Race car is an interesting palindrome in English. Allah Azza wa Jal gave our Messenger وسلم, words that he didn't write down. وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ Allah tells him. You didn't write anything down with your hand. You don't know how to write. So this is entirely an oral exercise for the Messenger وسلم, And he, once he says something, he doesn't edit it. He doesn't correct it. That's it. Allah revealed it and that's it. There's no, I didn't mean to say that, let me change the way I said it, etc, etc. Right? It's exactly the way Allah instructed him to recite. The challenge for mankind is, you see, the ayah, the simple translation of the ayah would be, declare the greatness only of your Lord. That would be a simple translation of, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Try to say, declare the greatness only of your Lord, in English, or French, or German, 
or Japanese or Chinese or Italian or Russian or Urdu or Farsi, you pick the language. Say it so that it spells backwards and forwards the same way and say it so you only have one attempt orally. No writing down, no looking up in dictionaries. How possible is that? Subhanallah. I can translate the ayah, but could I translate the miracle in English? If I tell you, declare the greatness only of your Lord, you get some of the message, but do you get the miracle? You don't get the miracle. The miracle of Qur'an is in the Arabic language. And this is just one small example. The Qur'an, every ayah has its own miracle. Every ayah presents its own miracle. The tragedy of our times is, most people don't even know the message of Qur'an. And for the people who know the message of Qur'an, the vast majority of them don't know the miracle of Qur'an. And the Qur'an is again two things at the same time, right? It's a message and a miracle. Two things at the same time. So this is something that's almost lost, a treasure that's lost from the general knowledge of the Muslim population. And just imagine, if our children even knew five ayat, they memorize Surah Al-Ikhlas, they memorize Surah Al-Kawthar, they memorize these surahs. If they knew those five ayat and they knew what they meant and then they knew the miracle in those ayat, wouldn't they have a different kind of iman in those ayat? It would mean something more to them. This is why you see a difference between our iman and the iman of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in. One of the reasons, among the many reasons, is that when they heard Qur'an, they heard the message and they also heard miracle. They heard two things at the same time. We at the most we hear one thing. At the most we hear one thing. So this is one reason to definitely be a student of the Arabic language. Because we want to appreciate the Qur'an and its message and we also want to taste the beauty of its miracle. I want to give you a simple example just on the side as an argument. Many of you have read poetry, some of you not because you wanted to, but because it was part of your class, you had to read it. Or you had to read some literature like Shakespeare, those of you that speak Urdu, may have read Iqbal or Ghalib or something, right? You've read poetry and song and you know, artistic literature in different languages. When you translate a poem from one language to another, when you translate Shakespeare from English to Urdu, or you translate Iqbal to English, does it have the same beauty? A word, the word of a human being, the word of a human being loses its beauty when translated from one language to another. And I'm not talking about the meaning, I'm just talking about the beauty, because poetry is about beauty, isn't it? What's lost is the beauty. We're talking about the word of Allah. Can there be any doubt in the beauty of those words? And when we translate the word of Allah, do you think there's going to be a loss in beauty? To describe this loss in beauty, as suyuti rahimahullah gave a beautiful example. He gave a parable. as suyuti rahimahullah was one of the first scholars to write on the sciences of, of the Qur'an. Al-itqan fi ulum al-Qur'an. And he says, if someone can imagine the distance between the creator and the creation. Imagine how how above Allah is from His creation. Then you can begin to imagine the, different, the distance between the words of the Creator and the words of the creation. Qur'an is the word of the Creator. The translation is the word of the creation. Is there a distance? SubhanAllah. How can you say one substitutes for the other? You can't, that, that, there's no room to make that argument. So this is the first point. This is just the first point. The miracle of Qur'an is lost. The second point is, Allah Azza wa Jal in the Qur'an says the word Qur'an, He uses the word Qur'an with the word Arabi. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا غَيْرَ ذِي عِوَجٍ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ أَوْ يُحْدِثُ لَهُمْ ذِكْرًا Allah Azza wa Jal says, بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍّ مُبِينٍ Eleven times in the Qur'an, Allah describes the Qur'an as what? Arabic. Every Muslim believes that every word in the Qur'an is exactly from Allah. You can't add to it, you can't take away from it. If Allah describes the Qur'an as Al-Qur'an Al-Hakim, like in Surah Al-Yaseen, Surah Al-Yaseen, Wal-Qur'an Al-Hakim, the Qur'an full of wisdom. We can never separate wisdom and Qur'an because Allah put them together. When Allah says Qur'an al Arabiyan, what two things can we never separate? Qur'an and Arabi. Did Allah put them together, we can't separate them. And on top of that, he said, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ 
In simple English, we without a doubt, we're the ones who sent down an Arabic Qur'an, an Arabic Qur'an, so you can understand. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So if Allah put understanding next to not just Qur'an, what did Allah put understanding next to? The Arabic Qur'an. So a key in understanding the Qur'an is what? The Arabic language. This was my second point. How many times does Allah mention Arabic in Qur'an? Eleven times. The third point. The third point is what is lost in translation besides the beauty. I gave the same example in the morning, I'll give you the same example now inshaAllah. The word nafs, the word nafs, you've heard that word before? The word ruh, have you heard the word ruh before? I'm gonna recite to you two ayat, one of them has the word nafs in it, the other has the word ruh in it. Allah says, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Which word did you hear? Everybody heard the word nafs? Then Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْرُوحِ Which word did you hear? Al-Ruh. The average English translation of كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ is Every soul shall taste death. Tell me what English word was used for nafs. Every soul shall taste death. What word? Soul. When Allah Azza wa says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْرُوحِ The translation says, they ask you about the soul. They ask you about the soul. Jazakallah khairan. May Allah make you an awesome basketball player. Football. football? Okay. Yeah, you guys are big on football. Anyway, they ask you about the soul. So there are two words in Arabic. Nafs and ruh. How many words in English? Ruh. Soul. Allah said two things, and the translator has no choice in English but to say one thing. Soul. So if you and I are thinking that we have an accurate understanding of what, of what Allah says, reading the English or Urdu or any other translation, we're definitely missing something. The Arabic language is very, very, very deep. I can't begin to tell you how deep, because I don't even know how deep it is. I'm a student myself. But I can tell you this. Allah says ins, ins, for human beings. He says insan, for human beings. He says anasi, for people. He says nas for people. He says bashar for people. He says insiya in Surah Maryam for people. All of these for human beings, right? All of these words? When you translate all of them, what do you get? Human being. But Allah used like a dozen different words. If Allah chose to use a different word, does it mean something different? Because if it meant the same thing, Allah would say the same thing. The Arabic language for one word has 12 different uses. There are 10 different kinds of anger. There are a dozen different kinds of just seeing. You know, different kinds of sabr and patience. Different words for it. And Allah uses different words in different places. I'll tell you this. There's another interesting example of this vocabulary issue. Allah Azza wa Jal sometimes uses the word qalb. Many of you know what qalb means. What does it mean? Qalb is translated heart. Sometimes Allah uses the word fu'ad. How does fu'ad get translated? Heart. Actually heart. Look at the sound in Arab, Ibn Manzur's text, Khan, heart. So Allah uses qalb, and Allah uses fu'ad. Thabbit qulubana. Thabbit qulubana. With ithbat, what did Allah use? Or tathbit rather, qulub. Linuthabbita bihi fu'adak. What did he use that time? Fu'ad. Sometimes qalb, sometimes fu'ad. And both time the translation in English says what? Heart. Now look at this ayah. I believe it's in Surah Al-Qasas. فَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا Which word did Allah use? فُؤَادُ or قَلْبُ You heard the word فُؤَاد? Read the rest of the ayah. لَوْلَا أَنْ رَبَطْنَا عَلَى قَلْبِهَا What word is this one? Hmm, same ayah. Beginning of it used فُؤَاد. The latter part of it used قَلْب when you read the translation, both of them get translated. Allah didn't mean the same thing. Because had He meant the same thing, He would have said the same thing. Those of you that take the course when it comes, I'll solve this riddle for you then, inshallah. I'll keep you thirsty until then a little bit. But this, you know, we need to build a thirst for the choices of words Allah makes. Because they're so precise. And there, it is impossible to pick another language that can do justice to that precision. It's very difficult. Even if you translate one word for anger, 
as fear, as you know, um, you know, uh, ghadab, for example, you take it and you translate it as anger. And another Arabic word for anger, you translate it as rage. Most people, do they know the difference between anger and rage? Same thing to us, right? He was full of anger, he was full of rage. I mean, we, look, we use these words interchangeably. The Arabic axiom is, there is no one word that is the perfect substitute for another word. Every word has its own connotation. Every word has its own little taste. So Allah's words are very difficult to communicate in another language. The most you can get is some general idea. But if you want to get precise, we need to resort back to the Arabic language. This was my third point in regards to vocabulary. My fourth point is regard, in regard to syntax, grammar, structure. You, many of you have read, Wallahu khabirun bima ta'amalun. Have you heard that before? Wallahu khabirun bima ta'amalun. Let's break this sentence up into three parts. Allah, khabir, and bima ta'amalun. Three parts. Have you ever heard, Wallahu bima ta'amaluna khabir? You've read that too, many of you. This also has three parts. Allahu bima ta'amaluna and khabir. Are both sentences, they, do both of them contain the same three ingredients? The word Allah is there, the word khabir is there, the word bima ta'amaloon is there. But is there a difference? Allahu khabirun bima ta'amaloon. Wallahu bima ta'amaloona khabirun. There's a difference. Read virtually any translation of these ayat, whether it's Urdu or Farsi or English or Spanish or German, you're going to get exactly the same translation of both ayat. To the tune of Allah has full knowledge of what you do or Allah fully has complete news of what you do. Essentially translated exactly the same way. But did Allah Azza wa say the same thing? No, He said two different things, right? So the issue of, oh, you can just read the English translation, or somebody says, I ha I've read the whole Qur'an, in translation. You really haven't read Qur'an. That's, it's not casual reading. It really isn't casual reading. Qur'an is a book that demands from its reciter, from its reader, that it be read over and over and over again if you want to understand it. You can't read it once and understand it. It's not that cheap, the understanding of Qur'an. It's expensive. It, you have to pay for it with time and effort. You can't just get the understanding of Qur'an just reading it casually. And people that do, most of the time get misled. I heard, I read this ayah in the Qur'an, it says this. And people don't even know the Arabic of it, and they're arguing on behalf of it. So this was, really my fourth case is on, the, on behalf of grammar, grammatical differences. Okay, there's a difference between when Allah says, لا ba fihi. What's the last sound you heard on Raib? Rai ba. But then he says, لا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ On khawf, you didn't hear khawfa. What did you hear? Khawfun. But when he said raib, he didn't say raibun. He said, لا رَيْبَ ba. With khawf, he said, لا خَوْفٌ They cannot be translated exactly the same way because they're not using the same principles of the Arabic language. They're two different principles. They demand, they require a different translation. But that's not the sensitivity most translations have. And it's very difficult to capture some of these things in other languages besides Arabic. Arabic makes many things clear that you know, there, it has certain elements that other languages don't possess. And this is not to insult English or Urdu or any other language. Remember, every language is from Allah. Allah Himself said subhanahu wa ta'ala, عَلَّمَهُ الْبَيَانِ He taught the human being articulation. Whether you articulate in Chinese or Swahili, or some you know, tribal dialect in the middle of Australia or something, all of those are from Allah. All articulation is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah just took one language and honored it above the others by giving it an extraordinary amount of clarity. And this is important because you know the worst thing that can happen to a religion is misinterpretation. The worst thing that can happen to a religion is misinterpretation. And much of the misinterpretation in the Christian tradition, you know where it starts from? It starts from translations. It starts from translations. So when you, when you call somebody the son of, right? In the Arabic also, in the Arabic expression also, you're the son of the soil. In English also, we say son of the soil. Sons of the land, right? Son of the sea means he's always at sea, right? So these sorts of confusions that occur in translation are avoided by Allah Azza wa giving us the absolutely clear Arabic Qur'an. So these were a few simple points I wanted to make about Qur'an. Now very, very quickly the next part. The Messenger told us, and you've heard this many times, in khutbah and otherwise. It's a hadith that's sahih, it's mentioned in the sahih of Al-Bukhari rahmahullah. 
And it's actually muttafaqun alayt. Also appears in Sahih Muslim. Khayrukum man ta'allama al-Qur'ana wa'allamahu. And in another narration, wa'aqra. The best of you are the ones who learn Qur'an and teach Qur'an. The best of you are the ones who learn Qur'an and teach Qur'an. We all agree that the people who understood the, the Prophet's words, sallallahu alayhi wa the people who understood his words best were the companions, the Sahaba. My understanding of hadith is limited compared to the understanding of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and these Sahaba. Because they were right there when the teacher was teaching. Right? When we teach our children, we quote this hadith, the best of you are the ones who learn Qur'an and teach Qur'an. So you say, I'm going to teach my child Qur'an. I'm going to invite a shaykh or a qari to come to our house or going to send it to the masjid so he learns Qur'an. Right? When we talk to each other and we say, my child is learning Qur'an, what do we normally mean? He's going to read the qaida, right? The safe kind. And then he's going to recite the letters. Then he's going to read the entire Qur'an, right? Does most of our concept of teaching our child Qur'an have anything to do with understanding Qur'an? The average Muslim, when they say, I'm going to teach my child Qur'an, they mean two things, recitation and memorization. They mean these two things. Again, remember these two things, because this is going to become important in a second. Recitation and memorization. Remember these two things. Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu was advising the Sahaba. The Sahaba were majority where, from where? Arabs, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, where were they from? They were Arabs. He's advising the Sahaba. Teach your children Arabic like you teach them to memorize Quran. An Arab companion advising his Arab companions to make sure that their kids learn Arabic. As important as them, for them to memorize the Quran. This is the priorities of the Sahaba. Umar bin al-Khattab says, تَعَلَّمُ الْعَرَبِيَّةَ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ دِينِكُمْ Learn Arabic because it's part of your deen. This is what he said. He said, لا يُقْرِئُ الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا عَالِمٌ بِاللُّغَةِ Another statement of Umar رضي الله عنه. He said, no one should be teaching Quran except someone who knows the language. Because they can make mistakes. There's a famous incident of somebody making a mistake in Qur'an in the life of Umar ta'ala But the real kicker that I want to share with you, the one that I, when I read it, I had to stop reading. I really had to stop reading. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah describes a nation that Allah gave them a book before us. He gave them a sharia before us, and He gave them a book before us. So they had a messenger, they had a book, and they had a sharia, just like us. But they did not do justice to their book. And they did not do justice to their messenger. In one ayah, Allah describes how they failed with their book. Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِي وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ Among them are uneducated, unlettered people. They don't know the book except their own wishful thoughts. And they do nothing but make assumptions. And amani means they don't know what it says, they just think they know what it says. This is what these people did with their book. Which book is it talking about? At-Tawrat. At-Tawrat. Now listen to this. The word that, they use, that Allah used for saying that they don't actually know, they think they know, wishful thoughts, is the word amani. Amani. The, one of the great mufassirun of Qur'an, probably the greatest of them all, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and Qatada radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When these people were making tafsir of this ayah, you know what they said? Amani ay tilawah. Ya'lamunahu hifdan wa qira'atan bila fahm la yadruna ma fiha. Amani in this ayah means that these people, all they did was tilawah. You guys know what tilawah means? Recitation. And then he went on and he described Bani Israel. How did he describe them? Ya'lamunahu hifdan wa qira'atan bila fahm. They know it only by memorizing and reciting without understanding. لا يدرون ما فيها They don't know what it, what's inside it. They don't know the meanings of what's inside. When I said we teach our children, what did I say? What are the two things we're worried about? Recitation and memorization. Ibn Abbas is describing who? He's describing Bani Israel and their crime against their book. And he says all they do with their book is recitation and Memorization and their real crime is they don't know what it says. They don't know what it says. 
This description you take to the Muslim world and you say, find me a nation of people that love their book, that recite their book, for God's sake they even memorize their book. But the vast majority of even the ones who memorize it don't know what they're reciting. Who does that describe today? It's a scary thought. That's a scary thought. Because that's not describing the Muslim in the ayah. It's describing Bani Israel, the nation that failed before us. It's a very serious issue. It's so serious that look at Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah. His students are pretty much Arabs. So when he was about to teach them Arabic, they said, we don't need to know Arabic, we speak it already. And he said, إِنَّمَا أَخْشَى عَلَيَّ طَالِبَ الْعِلْمِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَعَلَّ مِنْ نَحْوِ He said, the thing that scares me the most is a student of knowledge who refuses to learn and nahu means grammar, Arabic grammar. That he might enter and يَدْخُلَ فِي حَدِيثِهِ مَنْ كَذِبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he says, whoever lies against me on purpose has guaranteed himself a place in hellfire. And he said, this hadith scares me about my students, the ones of them who don't take Arabic seriously, because they might end up making an Arabic grammar mistake in a hadith. And therefore, they might end up saying something about the Prophet ﷺ that he didn't say. And what did he say about those kinds of people? They guaranteed a place in the hellfire. And these are Arabs, talking to Arabs. This is how seriously they took this subject. لَوَاجِبْ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ in his, his, his fatwa. It's absolutely mandatory on every single Muslim. So you look at the Sahaba, you find the concern for Arabic. You look at the, the great ulama of this ummah, you find the concern for Arabic. Why? Because it preserves the deen. It preserves the integrity of the religion. It preserves the proper understanding of the religion. And probably most important of all, it preserves your salat. It preserves the experience you have standing, you and I have standing in front of Allah Azza wa When the Imam is reciting the word of Allah, we should be going through a spiritual experience because the word of Allah is being recited. The word of Allah is being recited. The miracle of Allah is being presented to you and me. And here we are standing and yawning because we don't know what it says. That's a tragedy. These same words, can you imagine? Same words. The words that are being recited to us in Taraweeh. Those same words, when they were recited to Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was not a Muslim, when he heard the Prophet recite them, he ran away, he got scared. Those same words, when Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi, who was the leader of his tribe, he came to, to Mecca, and he saw the Prophet reciting Qur'an, he said, I've heard about this man. When people listen to him, they go crazy. So he plugs his ears, and he starts running. And then he turns around and says, well, why should I run away? These are just words. I can handle it. So he unplugs his corks. He goes back to listen to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa takes the shahada and tells us the story. He heard the, he heard the words, and he took the shahada. These are the words that the people who hated hated Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, Abu Sufyan before he had become Muslim, Abu Jahl. These people, you know what they used to do in the seerah of Ibn Ishaq? They used to go to the house of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all night. One, is, one of them is on one wall sticking his ear to the wall listening to Qur'an. The other one is on the other wall, the third one's on the third wall. And they're sneaking home before sunrise. And they run into each other. And so one of them says, what are you doing here? And the other says, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> They were addicted to listening to Qur'an. They swore to each other they'll never come back, they caught each other the next day. They swore to each other they'll never come back, they caught each other the third day, listening to Qur'an secretly. Then they said, if somebody finds, if the youth find out, then we're gonna lose our credibility. Because by daytime, what did they say? Don't listen to this man. The kafir of those days was more addicted to the Qur'an than the believer of our days. Isn't that sad? That's a tragedy. It would have more effect on them. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, la'anahullah, he came to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was known as like, he was the Sean Hannity of his day. If you know who Sean Hannity is. You guys should know you're in Texas. Okay. So, you know, he is like political debater, insults his opponents. He's known for like, really intimidating his opponent in, in debate. So they said, we can't handle Muhammad. This is the kuffar talking. We say sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They didn't. Why don't you go debate with him? Show him who's boss. Utbah goes, I'll handle it. He goes to talk to the messenger, and these Quraysh are on the side watching from like a hundred yards. Let's, let's watch this. It'll be a fun match. Right? And he goes to the messenger sallallahu and he starts insulting him. What do you want? Money? You want women? What do you want? Power? Is that what it is? Is that why you're bothering us and ruining our families? He starts insulting the messenger sallallahu 
The messenger sits quietly and listens. And when the guy is done barking, he says to him, Afaraqti ya Abul Walid. You done? Are you finished? Can I start now? And he says, fine, let me see what you have to say. Rasulullah wasallam starts reciting Qur'an, and in seconds, Utbah can't hold his tears. And then he tries to grab the mouth of the messenger wasallam. Stop, I can't take anymore. And then until the messenger got to the ayah وسلم, of sajda, and he made sajda, and Utbah came back, and they, the Quraysh, they saw him, and they said, the face you left with is not the face you're coming back with. It's like you've had face reconstruction surgery. He didn't become Muslim, but he was completely overpowered by Qur'an. Completely overpowered by Qur'an. That cannot be done in translation. That power of Qur'an exists in the Arabic Qur'an. And that is the experience you and I should thirst for, we should long for it in the salah. When we don't understand what Allah reveals in Qur'an, by the way khushu' most people think khushu is what? Paying attention in salah? Being focused in salah? Being humble in salah? Right? Allah Azza wa Jal defines khushu for us. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Isn't it time yet for people that their hearts should be full of khushu? أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts should be full of awe. They should be overpowered by the remembrance of Allah. And then Allah describes, what is the remembrance of Allah? وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ And what came down from the truth. Now what came down from the truth? Quran. The salah is an experience where we become khashi' over the ayat of Allah. But when you don't understand what's going on in salat, and you're really, really trying, you're really tr- trying hard to pay attention, the average sincere teenage boy or girl, standing in salat, not understanding what's going on, are staring really hard at the carpet and saying, they missed a stitch over here. Or this one goes this way and that one goes that way. It's not symmetrical. Or they're closing their eyes trying to picture the Kaaba in front of them. Right? They're doing all these creative exercises to compensate for the one thing, which is what? To pay attention to the ayat that are being recited. Allah is talking to us in Qur'an. It's a personal experience for the believer. That void needs to be filled. And wallahi, if we had that, then our, most of our problems are solved. Because that would mean five times in a day, we come and take Allah's advice in life. That's what salah becomes. We take counsel from Allah when we stand and recite Qur'an. Instead of us reciting Qur'an, the Qur'an starts reading us. Telling us what our life's like. I'll tell you one quick story about myself. I have, alhamdulillah, four children. But my oldest daughter, Husna, when you, when you have, how many of you have more than one child? Okay, those of you that do, can testify to this. When you have your first child, everything's awesome about them. Oh my God, a tooth! Or oh my God, they're standing! Oh my God, they said something. Even if they said, yeah, Right? It's amazing. <laughs> right? Did you record that? <laughs> By the time you have your third, fourth child, you're like, what's his name again? <laughs> but everything about the first child is special. I'm at home, I'm making salah. And my daughter is like on the side. Okay? Now, Allah Azza wa Jal's favor on the human being, He didn't give him tunnel vision, He gave him peripheral view too. Right? So I'm making salah, but she's in my view. Okay? And for the first time in our life, she put her feet on the ground, you know, hands on the ground, pushed off, and she's standing up for the first time. Right? This is my first child, and it's standing up for the first time, and I'm in Salat. So I'm in Salat, and I did this. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's a big deal. And it so happened, by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, I was reciting Surah Al-Munafiqoon to myself. And the next ayah I recited to myself was, "Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, la tulhikum amwalukum, wa la auladukum an dikri Allahi, wa man yafal dalik fa ulaika hum al khasirun." Subhanallah. Those of you who have iman, don't allow your money or your kids to take you away from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does so, they are the ultimate. Those are the ultimate losers. Subhanallah. What difference does it make when you know what you're reciting and when you don't know what you're reciting? If I don't know what I'm reciting, I go past it and I finish my salah. And if I know what I'm reciting, I forget that I have a child. My whole world starts collapsing in front of me because Allah speaks directly to my life. There's a difference. So this is probably the number one reason we should say Arabic is important. Now the last thing I'm going to tell you about the importance of Arabic. Last, last thing. 
the biggest obstacle between the average Muslim living in the United States and Arabic studies, the biggest obstacle is their own conviction that Arabic is hard. You and I say, I'd love to learn Arabic, brother. I just can't take two years off and go to Egypt or Saudi. I can't do it because I don't have that kind of time. I have a family to provide for. I have full-time commitments. I'm a mother, I'm a child, etc., etc. I can't do it. And it's difficult. I tried. I got fired up one time and I went to a conference and I bought a couple of Arabic books and I read the first two pages. By the time I got to the third page, I came across the word subjective and indicative and prepositional phrase. And I said, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha ilant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. The book is still on the shelf, looks brand spanking new. Right? Happens to a lot of us. So we have this conviction that Arabic is difficult. And when we see somebody who knows Arabic, we say, MashaAllah, that guy is so smart. Right? Like Allah made it easy for him, he didn't have to make any effort. It just came to him. But you know, when you see a painter or a calligrapher, you see how easy they make it look? You don't see the hundreds of hours they spent doing this. All you see is the final product. And you say, MashaAllah, this guy's got amazing talent. Allah blessed him. Allah blessed him after he sweat over it for years. Somebody recites Qur'an beautifully. Man, Allah gave him such a beautiful voice. No, no, no. The first time he recited, he couldn't get through A'udhu Billah with his shaykh for 35 times. For two months he was reciting Fatiha because he couldn't get it through. He stayed on it. Right? So we have to first of all shatter the idea that Qur'an, anything to do with Qur'an is difficult. Because Allah's promise is, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Allah's own promise, without a doubt, we have already made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. Allah's guarantee, Qur'an is made easy. He didn't say He made it easy for the Arabs. He didn't say He made it easy for the people who come from Southeast Asia because they already speak Urdu and lots of words are the same, you know. He said He made it easy for everyone. He didn't put a condition on it. He made it easy. He just put one condition. You know what that one condition is? Lidhikr. He made it easy. If you, your intention for learning Qur'an is to remember Allah. If that's your intention, then Allah guarantees Himself that He made it easy. But then He poses a question, SubhanAllah, what a question. فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ Is there anyone who consciously wants to make the effort to remember? Remember who? Remember me? He said, I made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. So is there anyone who wants to make dhikr? Anyone who wants to remember Allah? What does this ayah teach us? It teaches us the ultimate dhikr of Allah is what? It's Qur'an. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Allah calls the Qur'an a dhikr the ultimate reminder. You want to do dhikr of Allah? The best dhikr of Allah is the dhikr that Allah taught you Himself. That's the word of Allah. And he says, anyone wants to come forward and make dhikr of me, I've made it easy for them. So tajweed is easy. Learning the Arabic alphabet is easy. Learning the vocabulary is easy. Learning Arabic grammar is easy. Studying tafsir is easy. Memorizing Qur'an is easy. All of that's easy because Allah said what? He made it easy. Millions of children around the world without photographic memory, without even knowledge of the Arabic language, memorizing Qur'an. Isn't that a fulfillment of His promise? He said He made it easy? SubhanAllah. He made it easy. There are people I know that, are, that were you know, born in non-Muslim families and they were raised you know, completely in, in, in Western civilization. In their late 30s they took the shahada and now they're a father of Qur'an. Allah made it easy. They didn't, it's not their accomplishment. It is the gift of Allah for the one who wants to remember Him. This is the change in our intention, number one. Number two, the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Two hadith I'll tell you a little, One a little scary, the other encouragement But I gotta mix those two up The scary one is The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Was describing the end of time One of the signs of the last day And he said This will happen when knowledge disappears When knowledge is gone, this sign will occur What's interesting about this hadith is That the in the narration, we don't know what the sign is. Because what, what is about to happen in this event was so shocking to the Sahaba that they forgot the sign of the hour. So what happens next? Ibn Lubayd asks the Prophet 
He says, وَكَيْفَ يَذْهَبُ الْعِلْمُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ How will knowledge go away, O Messenger of Allah? وَنَحْنُ قَرَأْنَا الْقُرْآنِ وَنُقْرِئُ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءُنَا يُقْرِئُنَا أَبْنَاءَهُمْ He said, how can knowledge disappear when we have recited Qur'an? And we make our kids recite it. And our kids will make their kids recite it. Now wait a second. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say Qur'an will disappear. What did he say? Knowledge will disappear. How does the Sahabi understand knowledge? How, what did he say? How can knowledge disappear while we still have Qur'an? When the Sahaba heard knowledge, the first thing that came to their mind was Qur'an. That, this was the fundamental education for them. The Messenger tells us وسلم, in another hadith, مَنْ أَرَادَ الْعِلْمَ فَعَلَيْهِ بِالْقُرْآنِ Whoever wants knowledge, whoever intends to have knowledge, let him commit to the Qur'an. Let him stick to the Qur'an. This is, you know, this is knowledge. This hadith appears in Sahih al-Bukhari. But anyway, the hadith of Ibn Nubayd, when he said, how can knowledge disappear? The messenger got so angry. He got so angry. Thakilat ka ummuk, Ibn Nubayd. He said to him, may your mother lose her child, Ibn Nubayd. That's how angry he got. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then you know what he said? أَوَلَيْسَ هَذِهِ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى بِأَيْدِيهِمُ التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ لَا يَنْتَفِعُونَ مِنْهُمَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Don't you see these Yahud? And don't you see these Nasara, these Jews and these Christians? Right in front of their hands, what do they have? Torah and Injil. And benefit, they benefit nothing from them? Don't you see them? So he described a time that's coming when knowledge will disappear. Quran is still here. Like the Jews still have the Bible and they have the Old Testament. But even the parts that they haven't corrupted, they don't even follow those parts. Instead of even complaining, oh, they changed the book. The parts they didn't change, they're not being followed either. <laughs> right? The Muslim has the book of Allah in front of him. He has the halal and the haram and the fard and you know, the ibadat, all in front of him. Well, is he, is he benefiting from it? No, by and large, no. So this is a scary thing that we all have to, you know, inshallah ta'ala, take into consideration. Now the positive hadith, and I'm, I'm pretty much done in the next 12 minutes, I promise. 11 actually. I'll stick to my time. This hadith is probably my favorite hadith on learning Arabic. My favorite hadith. The Messenger says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Mahiru Bil-Qur'ani Ma'as-Safara Al-Kiram Al-Barara The one who gains expertise in the Qur'an is among the top ranked angels. Al-Safara, Al-Kiram, the noble, the righteous, the top ranked angels. The ones who get to touch Allah Al-Mahfud, those angels. Who has that rank? Once again, you remember? The expert in Qur'an. The expert reciter, the expert in the knowledge of Qur'an, the expert in memorizing Qur'an, the expert in you know, tajweed, etc, etc. Whoever gains expertise in Qur'an gains that darajah. But that's not you and me, we're not experts. What about us? The Messenger says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَالَّذِي يَتَتَعْتَعْ فِيهِ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقٌ As far as the one who stumbles in it, and finds it difficult is concerned, he stumbles in it. He can't pronounce the ayn, it hurts his throat. Every time he tries ayn, an comes out. Every time he tries baad, zwaad comes out. It happens. He tries to say dhikr, he ends up saying zikr. Right? Can't pronounce it. Can't remember the grammatical principles. Finds the language difficult. Finds it challenging. This is the next category. The first category was the expert. The second category, the guy who has a hard time. He says, falahu ajran. That person has twice the reward of the first one. The one who has a hard time. So if you and I, I started by saying most people say Arabic is hard, I tried, it's difficult. If it's difficult, I am envying you. I should be jealous of you. Because you get twice the reward of anyone who's awesome at it. Is there any reason left for us not to, not to learn this book? The one reason could have been it's too hard. And the Messenger ﷺ took that reason away. He said, if it's hard, you got twice the reward. <laughs> so it leaves no excuse behind. You know, if, those of you that are in college, you go to a course, the professor is like really hard, and the class is boring, you say, man, I'll just take it next semester. Right? As soon as it gets difficult, you find reasons to postpone. When Allah's book gets difficult, it becomes reason to stay. The Messenger changes our attitude So this is a refreshing of our intentions We make the intention and Allah opens the doors. 
That's all. On our end is the intention. That's all. You just have to make the intention. And you will see Allah open the doors. Instead of having the theoretical discussion, is Arabic important or not, I could give you proofs at the, all day long of why Arabic is important. But until it enters into your heart, that there's a love of this book, there's a thirst for this book that you want to have. And you want to acquire it for yourself. Until that happens, no knowledge, no fatwa, no dalil is gonna help you. You have to have that thirst that you want to have a better prayer. You want to recite Qur'an and you want tears to come down your eyes because you read the word of Allah That thirst will make you learn. That thirst will make you learn. I want to taste the miracle of Qur'an in the Arabic language. What is so remarkable about this language? This, this word that Allah Azza wa Jalla sent. How can this only be the word of Allah? Inshallah ta'ala, the next time I see you, whenever Allah wills, I'll share with you the wisdom, the divine wisdom, in Allah Azza wa Jalla using the words Alhamdulillah. In Fatiha, Allah says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, right? How come He didn't say, Inna Alhamdulillah, like the Khatib says sometimes. He didn't say, Lillahi Alhamd. He said, Alhamdulillah. He didn't say, Ihmadullah, Nahmadullah. Right? He said, Nasta'een, Na'buduwa, Nasta'een. But he didn't say, Nahmadullah. He doesn't say, Ahmadullah. He doesn't say, Ashukrulillah, or Athanaulillah. He chose specifically to say what? Alhamdulillah. Why is this one phrase better than all the other possibilities? What makes this one perfect? Right? These are the kinds of studies that you are able to engage in and appreciate the perfection of the words of Allah. The perfection. How subhanahu wa ta'ala, this can only be His word, it can't be anybody else's. And those of you that are into literature, English majors or you know, history majors that have read a lot of literature, subhanAllah you will appreciate of all the bodies of literature, all the great minds that have ever lived on the, on the face of this earth. All of their minds put together, the best literature in the world put together, cannot compete with but one surah of the Qur'an. You'll appreciate that, not just in theory but in practice, if you become a student of this book inshaAllah ta'ala. So now in like six, and, 6 minutes and 15 seconds, I'm going to talk about how to study Arabic. Okay? The biggest step in how to study Arabic is the intention. I want to remember Allah. That's why I'm learning. Not because I want to order a shawarma from the Arab restaurant. Okay? I'm learning because I want to remember Allah. If that's your intention, already half the job is done. Because what was going to be hard, now Allah has made it easy. Right? So that's, the, that's half the job right there. The intention. The second issue, the second ingredient that all of you need is... Actually what our program, uh, it was created with this one ayah in mind. That Allah facilitated the Qur'an. Well, I started learning Arabic in the year 2000. I didn't know any Arabic before 2000. And when I started learning, I went to one teacher, another teacher, another teacher, and I found that the Arabic courses were very difficult. The terminology is difficult. They want you to memorize a lot, all sorts of pressures. And I realized the difference between the, the Western model of learning and the Eastern model of learning. And basically what it boils down to is, in the Muslim world, there's no such thing as a bad teacher. There's only bad student. So if the student fails, it's not the teacher's fault. Whose fault is it? The student's fault. Even if the teacher was sleeping in class, it's the student's fault. There's no such thing as a bad teacher. But in America, it's almost like there's no such thing as a bad student. It's always the teacher's fault. Man, my professor, he doesn't know how to explain anything. He doesn't explain, he doesn't go over the test properly. RateMyProfessor.com, he only got three stars. You know what I'm saying? There's two different worlds. In one world, the teacher cannot be criticized. And in the other world, the teacher is always criticized. <laughs> right? But you and I are living in America. And we are in a consumer society. In a consumer society, the customer is always right. So who's paying the tuition? The student, huh? The student's always right. And guess which teacher is going to get fired from the university? The one who got a bad review. Customer is always right. That's how it works, right? Now it seems capitalistic and weird, but it's got some element of truth in it. You and I like listening, you know, you're, you're giving me your time. If I speak to you in monotone, and I have like a really thick Arabic accent or Urdu accent or something and I, you know, I don't even look around and I'm just totally boring to you, right? You're gonna start seeing people checking their watches and I, you know, eye contact with each other. You go to the car first, I'll come, I'll be right behind, right? Because you're paying me your time, you're giving me your time because you see maybe there's something worth it here. And this is how we work, this is how we operate, right? 
If there's a, if there's a speech that's really engaging to you, and there's a shaykh that's doing an awesome job, you're sitting there. When it gets boring, you kind of slowly. Or you, you're sitting up first, like you're straight up, then your elbow goes like this, then it stretches out a little more, <laughs> you know, and it goes in stages, right? But the point I'm trying to make is our program, I designed it looking at this not as a fault of the audience, but saying, okay, this is how we are. We can't change who we are. So we have to create a program where students stay awake. And students, instead of finding the class difficult, they find it easy. So the pressure is not on the student, the pressure is all on the teacher. This is the first difference between our Arabic program and most other Arabic programs. In most of the other Arabic programs, the teacher will say, this is your homework, I've already taught you the lesson, why don't you understand? What's the matter with you? Didn't I explain it properly? Oh, you have to do it again then? Right? Brother, we did this last week. This sort of idea. Our class, you don't understand? Okay, let me explain it to you another way. You still don't get it? Okay, let me give it to you another way. You still don't get it? Okay, see me right after class, I'm gonna sit with you personally 20 minutes until you get it. But I'm gonna make sure you get it. I'm here to make you get it. And you're not going home until you get it. Because all the pressure is not on the student, the pressure is on the teacher. Right? This is one thing that makes our program different. The second thing that makes our program different is, there's a difference in focus. A language has four skills. It has reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Reading, writing, speaking, and listening. When you want to study Arabic for religious reasons, to have a better experience in Salat, to have, you know, uh, to understand the khutbah in Arabic, etc., etc., then you don't care about speaking. It doesn't matter to you. And even if you learn speaking, who are you going to talk to? Your wife? You're going to say, leave me alone. Right? You try to talk to her in Arabic. You, talk to your, you try to talk to your Arab friends and you sound funny and they don't talk to you, they respond to you in English. Right? So the opportunities for practicing speech are limited to begin with. You're not going to use it in, at work, you might get fired. Right? So, you can't use it on the train, you know what happens there. Right? So, the opportunities for practicing spoken Arabic are very limited. After all, we are in the United States. But you know, if I teach you to understand the Qur'an, and to listen to it and to read it with understanding, but I don't teach you how to write. Do you have to learn to write to understand Qur'an? No. We can learn that later. Let me teach you what you really need right now. Let me teach you to understand right now. Let me teach you to listen carefully right now. Forget speaking. We'll learn it later on. If you really want to learn Arabic later on, then we'll, I'll teach you speaking too. But right now I know what you need. You, what you and I need is, we need to pay a little more attention in Salat. We need to pay a little more attention in Salat. I can give you that in 10 days. In our 10 day course, I can give you, now you're, you're having a different experience when you're listening to the Imam recite. You're paying attention, and you're noticing things, and those things are trying, starting to make sense. Bulbs are going off. It's better than before. I can't claim to you that you're gonna know Arabic in 10 days, that's false. That's not gonna happen. But I can with full confidence say, inshallah ta'ala, I exhaust my full energies in making sure you have a solid base in Arabic. After which if you do your own studies, they'll be much easier. Those books you put away will be easy to read. My job is to take the difficult parts of Arabic and make them easy for you. That's my job. Then if you want to progress, put the work in yourself, that's your job. But I'm guaranteeing my job side, the, the side that's my responsibility. Now briefly about the program, because my time for the lecture is over, it's sharp at 11. Our program is called Bayina. It's at bayina.com, B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H.com. And it started two years ago with myself and two other colleagues. Now we're a total of five. We travel around the country to Masajid. And we hold 10 evening courses. 10 straight nights, three hours a night. 7 to 10 p.m. for 10 nights. And our programs are attended by women, children, men, Everybody. And so our program, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, 42 communities and 4,000 students later, it's going very strong and we're booked for almost pretty much for the entire year. And we're making our first stop in Houston in the month of October, inshallah ta'ala. So I, I highly encourage all of you, the brothers here and those that you know, family members that are not here, the women also, that they come and attend the program and participate fully in it because first of all, because the list of communities is so huge now, 
it's difficult to bring the same program back to the same city anytime soon. So I don't know when else it's going to come. I mean, I wanted to do it earlier in Houston because I was interested in looking around in the area too. But I don't have any openings until October. But inshallah ta'ala, don't procrastinate. Make the intention that you're going to join. Those of you that are not going to be around, you can check out the website. And it lists wherever the course is going each month. So you could take it, maybe you have some family somewhere in California or Austin or wherever else it's going to travel from now until then. And you can attend the course there too, inshallah ta'ala. So I, I know I didn't take too much time explaining the contents of the course and the, the methodology of the course, perhaps another time bi idnillah. But I wanted to emphasize more on the first part, the importance and value of learning this subject. Once that is in your hearts, inshallah ta'ala, you'll find a way and Allah will open doors for you, inshallah ta'ala. So at this point, I'd like to conclude. If anybody has any questions or comments, you're welcome to make them, inshallah.